Welcome to the Heart of Soul podcast, an exploration of who you are, what you are, and why you are, offering new ways to investigate age-old questions at the heart of you. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. Today, we continue our series on the 13 fundamental assumptions of personhood dharma in identity. We complete our deconstruction of altruism and other selflessness illusions and move on to a criticism of traditional therapist client boundaries as impedimentary to real healing and finish with the hugely philosophically important discovery of an emotive based morality, which we don't complete until the next episode. So be sure to listen to 91 as well. If that, what's that phrase tickles your fancy. I don't know why I'm saying that, but there you go. Thanks so much for listening, or if you're on YouTube, for watching. Greetings and welcome. This is episode number 90. Seems significant. Hello, Stace. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we, Joseph and I were just talking before we switched on uh, about uh, each of us having a bottle of wine on our uh, during the podcast and sipping on our number 100. So yeah. we decided to be humanoidal uh, in that way and um, have some fun that 100th podcast. Yeah, I feel like I said, I've got the bottle in the fridge. I think maybe I'll take a Sharpie and write number 100 on it. And um, <laughs> the topic will be whatever we feel like talking about uh, while a little bit drunk, maybe, yeah. Um, yeah. or whatever. Or or we could demonstrate uh, how to reverse uh, the, al- the uh, alcohol <laughs> effect, uh, which... <laughs> If you can't, if you're an angel soul, you can do this. It just takes a little practice. Uh, mm-hmm. You can go go from dead drunk crawling on the floor to sober in about five minutes. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah, it is. I can attest to that. Um, I've done it. I don't think I've ever done it with myself nearly as effectively as you've done it to me. Uh, with, with permission, <laughs> well, of course. Uh, well, I boosted. I, I just boosted you. You were, uh, you were doing uh, at least half of it, if not more. I, yeah. So, I, 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 I'll have to tell the story now. I don't know if I told this in a previous podcast, but always bears repeating. There was that one time where um, uh, we were at that Greek place. I think I told this story and I was just drinking uh, a lot of wine. Remember the place on near the plaza on uh, oh, Granite yeah. Street? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. probably something mm-hmm. else now. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, and I was drinking a lot of wine, and I remember thinking, like, saying out loud, like, "Wow, I'm drinking a lot of wine, and I'm not just not feeling it at all." And you were like two seats to my right, I remember, and you just gave me this kind of sly look, and I was like, "Oh, are you you're doing something here? You're preventing me from getting drunk. Like, this is great because I love, I'm really enjoying the wine. I don't need it to make me drunk." And then you left earlier than some of the other people. And uh-huh. 60 seconds after you left, I was wasted. I was just plastered as if I, I don't think you talked. I don't think you talked. I never that told you. Podcast. That. No, you have to me, but I don't think in the podcast. Yeah, that was yeah. In, that was like the inverse. You hadn't done that before with me, but I was like, cool, I can keep drinking wine. And then I was I went from like zero point uh, zero zero to point one eight, you know, in like uh, a second. That was pretty it, funny. It, 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 it really hap- it's really uh, an asset to have me at a party for those of you that have to drive home because I can do- <laughs> I can keep that off you uh, just enough to get home. So yeah, yeah. yeah. not anyway. that we would recommend that or no, no, uh, that no, would be no, lawful, no. but it, it, yeah. Right. But uh, yes, if this sounds crazy and woo woo, then um, one day you'll just have to drink wine with uh, Stace and I, and we'll we'll give you the experience. Right? Don't believe it. Just no, look through the telescope it. and right, see right. for yourself. Yeah, and, and, and the reason we're unabashed about talking about this stuff is that identity includes the human as spiritual. So we can be pejorative and, uh, and funny and take forays into human expressions and see which resonate 100% with spirituality or 80. We never, we never get below 80 uh, in our downline stuff like this, so it's fine. No, probably not. No. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of uh, numbers, um, we yeah. want to talk a little bit more about uh, our ninth principle from last time. We were talking about the uh, what has been aforementioned as the unholy trinity of other orientation, perhaps uh, self-interest, non-self-interest, uh, sacrifice, and unconditional love before we move on to number 10. Yeah, it's just a, maybe a short little tender diatribe uh, about uh, how much uh, the premises of altruism, sacrifice, and unconditional love are embedded not only in the morality of our world, but in the embodied versions of ourselves as human beings in this world. 
uh, altruism, sacrifice, unconditional love is buried so deeply in the mm -hmm. world, the global zeitgeist, not just religiously, but in social societal contexts, communities, uh, in interpersonal relationships. This poison is embedded so deeply in the human condition that it's hard to overstate it. Yeah. And so that's why we spend a little bit of more than a little bit of time in identity uh, trying to unpack this for people to get them to feel the how all three of those terms, unconditional love, altruism, uh, altruism and sacrifice have no referent in the human condition. They're literally transposed out of ideation and embodied as if they are real things. Uh, I loved what you said last time. It was a great reminder again that um, all sacrifice originally was always intended as a transaction. Uh, it mm -hmm. wasn't one-sided. It was you did this, so the gods did that. Uh, it's uh, There's always a benefit to the sacrifice. Uh, and so why would we think, since that's the origin of the term, uh, the, the, the word that represents the idea, that represents the energy, that represents the a strategy of, of sacrifice has multiple layers backwards, always expected a, a boon in return. Mm -hmm. When did it become uh, uh, unable to ex have the boon in the transaction? Uh, and and the boon here is right staring us in, in, the, in the eye for, for religion. What's the boon of practicing unconditional love, altruism, and sacrifice? Heaven. That Jesus loves your ass, yeah. right? Um, eternal that, bliss. Pretty eternal good bliss. Mm -hmm. So think about that for a moment. Just let that sink in. That that the very definition of those three terms precludes a self-benefit. And yet you're going to go to heaven and you're happy to do that without realizing the metaphysical, utter metaphysical yeah. contradiction. And well, See? somehow like the sense I get is like, or like what I hear is like, well, that's a long-term benefit. It's like, just because it's an investment in oh. a long-term oh. ROI, then it like, it uh -huh. means that it's selfless now. And uh -huh. like, sure, that's going to help me get into heaven, but I'm helping you now <laughs> and I'm not getting anything in return, but maybe one day I'll get into heaven because of that. It, I could feel the sort of truth and service negotiation of it. Like, no, no, this doesn't help me. I mean, you know, all my good deeds come together. And then when I'm 95 and die, then I get into heaven. But right now, this is just for you. Like, that's sort of the argument. Right. And and if you want, if your stomach turned, listening to Joseph so beautifully articulate the Channel tones, the protector tone. Yeah. Channel the protector. These three terms were invented by our protective self to gain a surreptitious benefit that doesn't look like there's, you're serving a, a benefit. It's completely dishonest. Uh, like we said last time, if Mother Teresa had just boldly said, I serve people because I love Jesus and, and I want to spend eternity in heaven with him. What's the problem? You could never say that as, a, as an employee of Vatican, Inc., Vatican Incorporated uh, and still be an employee. Um, so, oh God, it's such a, it's sort it's of, such it, a poison. It, it makes me think of how like, um, you, know, you know, like a, a leader, like a CEO in a large company will talk about, you know, this business is a family and we're serving the world and making it a better place. But especially if it's a public company, their job is to increase shareholder value. Like, that's it. And if they don't do that, they get fired. But they're not allowed to say that. <laughs> or no, no. They, I, actually, I read something. I can't remember what company it was, but they did introduce. Yeah, I thought about writing a blog about it and then I decided not to. But yeah, there was a business I read recently. A uh, share value was like something they brought into the internal company, like with employees conversation, like they're talking about increasing share value with employees, which is ridiculous because the employees don't. Well, I mean, some of them might have some of the stock, but it's it's sort of the, the bleed through in a public company of like, oh, now the truth is actually showing up like in a company like an airline or something. They're so share price driven. Yes. Um, with a big board with people with, you know, tons of dollars and the CEO is evaluated based on that. But the CEO is trying to access the self-interest of the employees. So like 
come on, don't you want to be part of the team and, you know, serve your fellow man and woman here? And it's all a manipulation to get the share price to go up so the CEO doesn't get fired. And, you know, both can be true, but why don't you also name that if the share price doesn't go up, you get fired? Because that's also true. It's the same kind of thing. Exactly right. Uh, And this leads right into another podcast uh, where we go into a deep dive on money uh, that, 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 that it happened in the early 1970s. And I'm going to be real here. I've got to change my shade setting oh, go ahead. because this looks a little funny on the podcast. One second. Yes. If, if, you're, um, if you're listening, this doesn't matter to you, but don't be selfish. There are other people who will be watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I only get a little stripe here now. So this happened in the 70s uh, when it became a de rigor default, uh, the switch from competency and service on the product uh, of the product or service was subsumed into shareholder equity. Yeah. Uh, This is why corporations exist, not to make a profit while being uh, doing better with their product or service than their competitors. What's the shareholder take? Um, that got legitimized. I always forget the name of the guy who did it. Uh, it was head of the, um, the not not uh, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve, but somebody really a high economic advisor mm-hmm. to the president at the time. So that's when everything went to shit in terms of corporate power. Uh, it's and similar to getting about- off the gold standard. It's, it's similar oh, yes. around the same time where it's just like oh the. Yeah. The um, yes. the shareholder value, the ability for the business to produce money for people not working, that's yes. what shareholder value is, uh, <laughs> is more important. That's like um, you know McDonald's is a real estate company. Yes. They're not interested right. in producing high quality food. They're no. interested no. in acquiring a shit ton of real estate and enjoying the appreciation of it and passing exactly. it on to their shareholders. It's embarrassing. Oh God, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll do this a little later uh, yeah. when Nixon uh, the gold standard. Is, is not a cure-all panacea, but it gave some objective reference to value as opposed to floating it in the general GDPs of all the countries in the world. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, but th- this is related to um, to the sleight of hand, the same yeah. sleight of hand as you just described in uh, in these three these three poisons that have gotten so far into our drinking water of consciousness, we don't even notice them. <laughs> well, and there's one, and I don't think we talked about this last time, but I actually don't remember really anything from last time. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the 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 insidiousness of um, altruism and unconditional love, yeah, it cannot be uh, overestimated, and it can be extremely subtle until you know how to listen for it. Like yeah. the the a priori assumption in a couple that each yes. person yes. is supposed to be delivering unconditional love to the other, yes. right. which is often talked about, but even if it's not talked about, the assumption that there's some sort of service relationship that each yeah. has with the other which is the root of compromise. Like, oh, I'm not getting what I need right now and you need something. So I'll just set aside my needs as if they don't exist and then serve you unconditionally, parentheses, with the hope that in the next moment you might be able to do that for me. Well, then that's not unconditional, isn't it? That's just an (laughs) ongoing negotiation. Exactly. (laughs) That's like what the two two sides of the Senate do, right? It's like sometimes the Democrats get to win, sometimes the Republicans get to win. None of it is altruistic or unconditional at all. And then people wonder, and then there's no relating going on. It's just alternating Folk, unconditional service. Strategy, yeah. Strategies. Strategies. I'm so glad you uh, brought that in because that's exactly the the, the kind of end end game I wanted to get to here. The worst Mm. damage of this is not done in religions. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's that you could say there's a meta damage in the moral codes, the Mm -hmm. uh, value systems that are inculcated by this nonsense. But the worst, the worst is uh, an intimate relationship. And people don't even realize that their no. notions of unconditional love in a relationship comes right. from Christianity. Yes. So you see it in atheists. Yes. And, and they have no idea that like yeah. they're trying to live a Christian value in a non-Christian yeah. life. They, they might as well be Christian. They'd probably be better yeah. off being Christian because then they could really go all the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, at least they're, they're congruent with their own consciousness. Yeah, yeah I've seen humanistic uh, philosophy uh, hijack altruism as an innate human quality 
not a, d a direction from God, but an innate human quality. A and and what we're saying here is love, service of love is an innate quality, mm -hmm. but not self-abnegation. Yeah. If, if service of love is real and innate to our soulful and human being, then then if you say, if you want to take away the very beings, integrity and substance as the purveyor of that love service by abnegating it with the nonsense of sacrifice or altruism or unconditional love, you where's the love, the actual healthy love service going to come from? Well, a non-person, uh, a person who's who's doing it for a strategy of their own to get into heaven or so you have sex with them tonight. Uh, what right. uh, the, the level of strategy uh, in a, any in a, any intimate relationship is directly tied to the unconscious poison of these three elements in all of our all around the globe. Different cultures have different versions of it, but it's a it's a global pandemic virus. These three epidemic. And, Epidemic. No, 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 yeah. no. Pandemic's why bigger. I, Pandemic, how yeah. could I have forgotten that? Epi oh, yes. Uh, Epidemic's low. Uh, I had it backwards <laughs> before the COVID pandemic. That was my one of my biggest takeaways <laughs> from COVID was learning the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic. Yes. yes. <laughs> the, the point being here, identity stakes a definitive uh, 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 wooden stake in the ground. Like the Buddha said, the earth is my witness. Uh, there, I just made some noise on my table. Sorry. Yes, uh, and so, so uh, as not to only curse the darkness. I don't remember. I don't right. think we talked about this last time. But identity would say that if what you do is healthy for you to do, then yes. it's healthy automatically for other. And yes. in order to do, in order to get to such a place with any yes. regularity and consistency, you have to yes. do a lot of outworking of the wounds underneath the unconscious strategies that drive yes. the vast majority of people. But there is a place to get to where you just do what naturally is healthily good for you and it automatically your cup runneth over and serves other people. So you don't have to strategize. That's, That's the right. goal. And the, and the hardest part of embodying that lighting a candle solution is, is getting what it means to actually embody emotive, emotively mature motives. Mm -hmm. In other words, what Joseph is saying here in another dimension is that you will automatically inhabit your intimate bond to the degree you've auto you have healed your relationship with yourself and your right uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, ask for healthy needs and wants uh, in intimacy. Uh, both partners, uh, or if you're into more, well, we'll only speak of two because more than two, <laughs> you're already into more uh, poison stuff uh, in the modern day. But but uh, uh, for the two people to stand for their emotionally mature wants and needs requires a long dharma to get at the unconscious motives that are just drilled so deep in us, we don't even know they're there. Yeah. So. So in that sense, uh, let me repeat uh, number nine. Human beings, this is identity's stake in the ground. Uh, human beings are incap incapable of non-self-interest, altruism, sacrifice, and unconditional love, anti-self delusions that undermine healthy nourishment and relationship with ourselves, others, and spirit. Divine being doesn't want us to buy into this stuff. Divine being is structurally uh, um, transactive <laughs> you know mm. we, we also oh we can't have religious we're transactive then then we want some pit, uh, tit for tat right I, we are expressed expressive downline uh, uh human versions of an upstream divinity it mm. can't help but transact itself through us so you can't subtract transaction, the term, uh, that there's mutual benefit and mutual harm. That's what's mis missed out with transaction. Um, transaction is not just goodies for goodies. It's, it's poisons for poisons. Uh, we will transact our poisons to the degree we don't transact our emotively mature uh, soulful being. I, I, I chuckled to myself there randomly showing some of my uh, autism streak laughing at a thought I had that was completely not related to what you were saying. But <laughs> I want to reveal that. Sometimes it happens. Um, I, while you were talking, I, I felt into what what is relating with God like 
if you're trying to serve it because that's like so not the arrangement. And, and so I felt into that. And then the image, I, so the first thought was like, well, then you're not relating with God. So yeah. like, because if you're trying to serve it and that's not its structure, the structure or what it wants, you can't relate with it. If your frame is, I want to serve you. Yes. Uh, and then the, the, for some reason, the image I got is like, that's like asking your cat to do your calculus homework. It just doesn't, that's why I laughed. <laughs> Oh, it's just good. like what? It's, yeah, it's not gonna. Metaphor. It doesn't want service from you. It's huh? No, <laughs> no. And l let's make another metaphor that, that I just got inspired. Just came into me for what your beautiful metaphor there about cats and calculus. <laughs> uh, if we're trying to serve God, think of a trumpet, and so we're blowing through this trumpet that has a smaller at our end. We're doing something, and it's got a trumpeted, you know, uh, uh, the the bell shape at the other end. That's going to God. We're trying to serve it. And if uh. it's everything's transactional, what's actually happening is that you've got the trumpet reversed. You're holding the bell thing and, and trying to blow into a smaller hole on the other side uh. because divine being is going, what are you doing? I'm not insecure. I don't need service. I don't need glory. I don't need uh, um, uh, adoration. I don't need hymns. I don't need churches. I don't need sacrifices. Mm -hmm. What are you people thinking of? My heart is full of sorrow. That's and then on the other side, when people do pray for things, it's almost always in content, not yeah. oh, yes. like well, make help my aunt not die of cancer or can I have more money or whatever, not can I help me to learn what it is I'm supposed to be learning here. It's in a uh, context evolutionary thing, which is what it cares about. It doesn't care That's what about cares. how much money you have in the bank or, you know, um, whether your duck will lay more eggs or not. Um, it, it doesn't relate to people so much in content because that's just the vehicle for our evolution. So that's another way where we misconnect with God. Beautifully said, and I can I can complete that beautiful uh, metaphor with um, the only prayer that, that makes divine beings smile the most is, please tell me what I should pray for. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the ultimate meta that divine mm -hmm. being then has got all the room to help you because basically what you're praying for is probably serving your 70% uh, degree, your, your protective self, not your authentic self. And divine being sees that we have to create protective selves in this world that we've created, but it's, it can only communicate through our soulfully authentic self. And, and that's what EBE, the Dharma personhood Dharma does. It helps people heal and reverse those, those, uh, those um, percentages mm -hmm. from 70 protector, 30 soulful to 70 soulful and 30 protective. Uh, and I want to quote um, the your poem slash prayer, my creator, let all turn a flame so that the sifting of my ashes yields the indestructible. Uh, yes. That that prayer I uh, invoked a number of times before an ayahuasca ceremony. No and kidding. It worked. Oh, Joseph. It worked in quotes every time i literally sometimes had the experience of burning down in the ceremony it, 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 it worked it worked so well i had to start being very careful when i said it or not like i had to be up for what it brought it worked let me repeat that mm -hmm. in, in, in a way because it, that's so de rigueur in our in our world and yeah. we're, not, we're not always all of us uh, equally applying it as much as we could the one prayer that i prayed my whole life let Oh, my maker at the time, the original ones, oh, oh divine being, let all turn a flame that the sifting of my ashes yields the indestructible. That's the burning down of all of our unconscious blockages and in conditioning. Um, it's a sainthood dynamic, but it applies directly where the rubber meets the road in personhood mm -hmm. uh, when you're praying for stuff uh, for your human life. Let it all turn. Let bring all the calamity upon me, so it burns me down out of my um, out of my delusion of my protector version of selfhood. So, thanks that's for a yeah, that. that's a completely different value system. Thinking of like God wants me to have lots of money, be successful, and happy. Uh, yeah. See happiness episode from a few <laughs> times ago. Versus God wants me to get in reality, abide with. Yeah. It, which yes. is reality, and yeah. um, and just discover who I am subtractively and uh, Subtractive. deconstructively, 
which yes. is um which then makes sense of why bad things happen to good people because they're necessary to wake you up Yes. And um, for example, right now I'm dealing with a na neighbor who is very loud and I can't play victim to that loudness. Um, try as a part of me might, although he's not so able to anymore either. But it's I, I can't help but accept it because it's so perfectly triggering the remains of the control that I have. It's it's in I'm inside my very home with the windows closed and his music still gets in my house. And it is the perfect thing. I can almost not even say the word because uh, it feels like acid in my mouth for some yeah. part of me. But it is the perfect thing to um, erode the remaining uh, control-based relationship to reality I have. So yes. uh, should I pray? Most people would be, pray, God, please let my neighbor be struck by lightning. Get him to sell his house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make him turn his music down, but sometimes I'll just go out on my deck and you know take my earbuds out and just open my arms and be like, oh, let it just hurt me so that I won't yeah. be hurt by this anymore. Yes. Let me just get all the way to the bottom of it because, and, and it's working. It's becoming more and more, I wouldn't say it's becoming more tolerable. I'd say the me that it's intolerable to is losing control. That's what yes. is actually happening. He's less and less of me. Yeah, the, so. well, so well said. And thanks for sharing that, uh, revealing that, Joseph. Beautiful example. Yeah, our, our, our protective selves uh, are born and express every single day the necessity of control. So my prayer to divine being was help me burn away my control mm -hmm. uh, in that way. And that brings the largesse of soul possible or proximal to our local human consciousness. So the religions have taught us backwards, as we said in earlier podcasts, uh, only insecure, arrogant gods uh, want to be adored. Uh, uh, I had a quote here. Uh, I, I can't find it. I was looking for it before the, the, uh, the podcast, but about how a pastor directly, a Christian televangelist, uh, directly said that uh, it's an affront to God to... Um, to uh, not call embryos people because it affronts its own self image. He right. You definitely word. don't want to offend God. It's, it's very sensitive. Oh, God. <laughs> the omnipresent, just... all powerful being, according to their paradigm, has really thin skin. Yes. And <laughs> oh, the ridiculousness of it. Uh, we get it. We, I really get it. You know, uh, uh, Christianity and, and re religionism in general, it's for young souls. It's the only way they can access the feeling of sacredness. But, oh, my God, do they need these juvenile kinds of incorrect, not applicable to the human condition, dogmas, dogmatic uh, uh, items? Maybe they do. But if identity has something, anything to do with it in 100 years, They'll still be religions for young souls, but they won't contain, they won't possess these kinds of, um, of uh, anti-human dynamics in their dogmatics. Mm. That's the hope anyway. Mm. Okay, so uh, now all those pre previous nine are some of these assumptions that, uh, that healing uh, our, our person, our, our local version, our local incarnative self, uh, now comes to the point of working with someone. What does that entail? Uh, number mm -hmm. 10 says, uh, our assumption is traditionally rigid facilitant therapist boundaries unnaturally prevent the human heart level connection necessary for true emotional healing. Uh, I, Joseph can give lots of examples of this. I'm sure that he knows one that stands out for me is a psychologist who stopped shopping at a grocery store uh, that uh, 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 two of their clients uh, shopped at regularly, so he wouldn't, they wouldn't meet him outside of the office. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what, what psychology enforces as necessary to keep clean the boundaries. And, and the, in, the inference here is that we, they don't want either the, the client feeling awkward about the role because it's all role based in that office uh, who's got the role of which which dynamic but it's also to prevent this the the, the therapist from counter transference yes uh, and, and what's so crazy about the, the counter transference one we'll talk about that in a moment but uh, the transferous one that the transference version is exactly the one thing freud got right mm -hmm. really right the therapy was about inducing transference from the parent 
uh, of their original parent uh, uh, to the the therapist. Mm -hmm. You see, Uh, you're supposed to elicit the conflicts with mama and papa with the new authority called the therapist. Mm -hmm. He got that right. What he did with it, he he ran down field the wrong direction. But that alone, transference is the key to healing. And counter-transference, of course, is when it's reversed and the therapist has emotional needs of the client. So they want to stop either uh, transference or co-transference, which goes against one of the founders. uh, And also, but then the healthy way, they want to help stop counter-transference of a a a therapist. But (laughs) grocery store running in the grocery store ain't one of them. So uh, it's just so amazing. And and, and a a sidebar on this, Joseph, I I found you can't find co-transference much um, uh, at all in parenting modules. Right? <laughs> I've never seen it. I had to, we had should, identity. Should be, on the, the first. should be in the title of any parenting manual book, like how exactly to not right. transfer onto your kids. I found the first, the first example that psychology is beginning to wake up to it. Mm-hmm. And, and you know what they're calling it? It's a very formal term now, parentification. They're calling no the chi- where the child becomes the serving the parents' emotional needs when it should be the other way around. Parentification. Uh-huh. I was so That's, happy to hear that. Um, sounds like a word you would make up. <laughs> it, yeah, it was like parentification. We call it parental co- counter-transference. Uh, yeah. We call it for what it is, but parentification, isn't that great? So they don't know really what to do with it, but they were, I just read an article where they have – if. It, uh, how to tell as an adult if you were a victim of parentification. Oh, yeah. I got a, uh, oh, that's first of all, wonderful. And I was just reminded of, I can't, I, I, it, it, it's lovely to make through lines um, in entertainment, of course. I was watching Survivor, because I talked about oh, that yes. last time. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I, and in, in this Survivor episode, one of the things that they do that is always interesting is like, I don't know, a third of the way through the season, one of the rewards will be uh, the, they fly in loved ones and give, make a cameo oh of loved oh. ones and they participate in the challenge and whoever wins gets to spend a bunch of time with them and usually invite someone else to also otherwise the family goes away but there's this touching moment where they show up and you know these people have been basically shipwrecked for whatever 15 20 days and they're just feeling very emotionally unsupported and stressed so you know it's a big deal and this one contestant who's just super super anxious like most likely an Enneagram six and really yeah. jumpy uh, and like that the, that's was the contestant and so her mother shows up and you just see this like 15 second interchange with them the kid becomes the parent her anxiety disappears and she immediately is taking care of her mother who's so worried about her so much oh, so that the host jeff remarks and says wow who's the parent here actually yeah. said that and i was wow. like oh my god that's where all the fucking anxiety comes from she had to become yes. her parent and i've yes. seen this in in people when there's really intense anxiety in people a lot of times it's because at a really early age they're carrying the anxiety of the parent when it, exactly. i mean everybody almost everyone has this to some degree but in these really acute cases it's just phenomenal to watch that even the host of survivors could read it out therapeutically. Well, that must have been pretty overt that yeah. way. And, and you know, we've got a lot to say about this topic. And uh, to cut to the chase with it, um, virtually all parents parentify their children to the degree they are not in possession of their authentic self before they have children. Now, yeah. let me say that again. No one has ever gotten, according to identity, you don't have to believe it, please don't, uh, according to identity's view, and it can be demonstrated directly uh, in embodiment, that um, no human being uh, has ever been raised by emotionally mature parents because by default we're all two-thirds emotively inauthentic and have never been reflected, that has never been reflected to us qualitatively or quantitatively anyway, a bit qualitatively by the shadow, of course. But so all of our addictions, like we said, talking about last time are all substitute fuel for the lack of that parent, that emotionally mature parent to feel what you're feeling, a child is feeling while they're feeling it and while why they're feeling it. So in that sense, uh, if you see an adult who's been parentified 
serving the emotional needs, not the physical ones in an elderly parent, that's not it, the emotional needs of a parent, we always point out that that didn't start that moment. The parent trained the child to do that unconsciously, unconsciously. So when we say, we, we, when we're criticizing parents here, we're not criticizing parents who did the best they can do, we're criticizing parenting. The, the paradigms of parenting that have never appreciated how often a emotively uh, parents with a huge emotional deficits in their own emotional body from their parents and their parents and their parents just pass that virus on to the next generation. I was talking to a client earlier today who related to me a story where his just recently his mother, who's in her late seventies, I think maybe older, um, was talking to him and said to him. I want to tell you some things and I want you to just listen and don't interrupt me and I'm going to say things and I just want you to listen and not tell me, not give me any commentary in, in amidst it. And then proceeded to unload all these judgments about his spouse. And what we were debriefing about that was like, and this is one of the best re reasons to stay in touch with your parents as, as an adult yes. in limited ways. In limited to, ways, yeah. Just to notice, like, notice how she set the frame of control. Like, I'm going to be a certain way, and this is how I need you to be. Like, That's what wrong, adult man. needs to say, I'm going to say some things, and here's exactly how I want you to behave while right. I'm saying, like, it's just pure control. Uh it, only a toxic self unworth would drive such a ridiculous uh, 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 ability to put that out there like that. In other words, it wants the child to make it safe for the parent. Yeah. What? 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 Uh, wait, everything's backwards here. The child isn't supposed to take care of mommy's feelings anymore. Yeah. Right. So this is why uh, what we're talking about here, remember the framework we're in traditionally rigid uh, 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 therapeutic um, boundaries are meant to offset this. So the authority of the, of the, of the therapist um, doesn't need the emotional support of the client and the client isn't, uh, is supposed to let it all come out about what the, what the therapist triggers in them for healing. That's what Freud really uh, cemented in as a cornerstone. So, but what, what we're trying to say here is, again, let's light the candle, um, traditionally rigid. Um, uh, we have, we've proven, and we're living the proof of it now, it takes a long time, but there's a point where it, more emotionally mature people can hold space for each other. Mm -hmm. People think they can do that now, that you see this peer, peer uh, therapy in groups. Uh, this is one of the most twisted truths in service uh, there's a truth to it, but you've got to only emotively mature people can do it, can do it without doing more harm to each other. Yeah. Because while there's unconscious motives for whatever one group peer member, peer review member, whatever it is, uh, gives another, there's going to be loaded reasons why they gave that reflection and loaded unconscious reasons how it's going to be responded. And if there's no one person holding the space, unless one person takes turn in the ground to hold the space for everyone, uh, every group, that's a little better. But still, mm -hmm. when emotively immature people chock full of unconscious motivations, try to do peer reflections, it's a mess. Does, does, can sometimes something good come out of it? Sure, behavior. Well, my guess would be most of the time they avoid anything really deep and confrontative yeah. in order yeah. to preserve a friendship. Be yeah, exactly. Uh, of the time. Well, but when when you get past a certain point, it's about 60-40 is the minimum. When you've reversed the 70-30 protective neurotic selves, protective self uh, 70 and, and soul self 30 to 60-40 the other way, you can begin to loosen a little bit some of the power power gradations you've got to have to mix them at the same time if you're early in therapy or early in ebe in our therapy you can't mix those things uh, yeah. so well if you're already great friends and you both have skills that way you got to be really careful mm -hmm. if, if one if one of you if you're both in working with a, uh, an ebe facilitator and then you try to help each other with that 
it's you can squeak by sometimes doing okay but it's full of landmines so mm -hmm. you've got to get that reversed uh, architecture of your soulful consciousness inhabiting your your human life yeah. before you can really do that my experience is that um in my own uh growth arc is that the more i embody my own self-authority the less i need an image of it or a presentation oh, of it nice, or nice, yes. you know not going to grocery stores kind of it because the 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 authentics what <laughs> phrase did i just say the not going to grocery stores of it that was that was weird that i was said great. that and then it was my, some my mind was like what did you just say <laughs> that was great that was perfect i, I it's was somehow right with you somehow made sense and then my mind was like i don't think that made sense okay um uh, yeah i'm going a little mad uh so <laughs> yeah the authentic self has a natural self-authority that doesn't need to present anything or do anything or right. go somewhere or not go somewhere it just is but if yeah. to the degree you don't have that then you know you can't go to the same parties as the person or, or whatever right. but I, yeah. I, can you say more about what the traditional therapist boundaries are because I know like some of them, but like, you know, to start with like Freud's whole thing of the patient looks at the ceiling and yeah. the therapist looks at the patient, that was right. Uh, right. because the, um, so the uh, therapist would not counter transfer. Correct. People only do that in psychoanalysis now. That's right. They've only relaxed a whole lot. Freudian stuff, yeah. 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 But the boundaries like, um, uh, not hanging out socially um, in in any way, shape, or form. I'm trying to think of just like what even very, very secular humanistic psychology, what would they hold as boundaries? Well, um, I think what the, the examples I've heard in the past, um, if I remember correctly, and they feel right to me, is, okay, so um, humanistic uh, psychologist runs into a client at a grocery store, but they both walk into each other, buying organic chicken okay oh, definitely organic yeah yes uh and uh and they in, say it the, organic like that yeah <laughs> that's like that. what i try to do <laughs> organic. organic it's organic yes okay so um uh the 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 ideal situation in a more humanistic uh, psychological sense a reasonable boundary would be the therapist leading going oh uh I think I, am I noticing that you feel a little awkward right now? Are you? Do you feel awkward? Oh right God! Now? They go into an authority role right away. Well, oh no! But as a but as a person, they they uh -huh. they say, oh, or they might say, oh, this is awkward, huh? Uh, mm -hmm. To the client, uh, and then the client has a chance to come up with, oh, I'm I'm so glad you named it, even if they don't say that. At least someone names the awkwardness. Mm -hmm. uh, once that happens, you can both the, the client and the and the and the therapist can laugh about it and said well it's interesting uh, yeah i like that chicken too now they can meet uh, on, on that on that level for a brief okay. few moments and then part part and see you next week you know uh that that's as far as they would go in an idealized uh okay uh keeping the boundaries but not being crazy not about right them. it would be a the, there'd be a minimalist frame to the interaction yes, minimalist mm -hmm. yeah but uh, again, uh, the reason I word the premise this way is is because the for someone to recover from their own uh, um, uh, armor over their fourth chakra, front and back, uh, requires an open-hearted facilitator, or else we're just trading um, uh, controls with each other. Right? Yeah, not they need a person with an open heart, not a role. Exactly, mm -hmm. and roles are what define uh, even uh, even minimalist uh, uh, psychological yeah. uh, structures. Right, so there's no role. Uh, there's a function. It's which is different than a role in our yeah. picture. There's a function of authority that's understood and accepted. It doesn't have to be this, you know, it's just just a little bit. Uh, okay, so a, a what, 20% incline or no, 2%, yeah. whatever that is. 2%. It's, it's hard to describe, but it's like, I mean, for um, helpers of humans of all kinds, the therapist, coaches, whatever, one of the things that fits here, I think, to talk about is the tendency for such helpers to uh, over identify with the role. Yes. And right. like I once right. did, I did a number of talks for an entrepreneur's organization, EO group. It was about, I don't know, eight people. 
uh, in that group. And one of them was a psychiatrist who was quite noted, like is the kind of psychiatrist who would show up on the nightly news if there was some kind of psychological news or something. And so this was like a minor celebrity. And I did a number like of Dr. talks. Phil. Like Dr. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, not quite. Not Dr. Phil. He's, but wait, he's, I, I have to say it the right time. Dr. Phil. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Sorry. By the way, he he recently no not I don't know a few months ago he did a club random podcast with Bill Maher that I found really fascinating. I highly recommend that. It was really interesting uh-huh. to hear more about himself and his politics and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I ended up liking him a lot more. I'm gonna get you excited about your life. That's my Doctor <laughs> Phil impersonation. But I actually ended up liking him a lot more. Phil McGraw. Um, okay. He's he's become more relaxed and less controlling. It seems. But Good. this psychiatrist did not drop her role. I could just tell. I could feel it. She was in the psychiatrist role and stayed as this authority. And I don't remember what I was talking about, but I threatened the shit out of her paradigm. And she was like, I could tell she was getting really kind of antsy because Mm -hmm. you know how it is. You and I are in a room with a therapist. They just start to get really (laughs) itchy and they don't know why. Yeah, um, right. because we're walking threats to their paradigm. And I yes. don't even know how direct I was getting, but like we are people who stand for the deconstruction of coping mechanisms. And a psychiatrist yes. is yes. a walking proponent of coping mechanisms. So there's yes. a clash there. And it's so right she's, there paradigmatically. Yeah, yeah. And I don't even know if she knew what it was, but she stepped, she sort of just kept going higher and higher energetically and just removing herself personally. And I was like, oh, there's the role. There it is. There's the expert. There's the doling out of pharmaceuticals. And she wouldn't say, she wouldn't be vulnerable. She would just sometimes say, I'm curious about blah, 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 but wouldn't actually ask a question. Yeah, which no, is, that would be, that would, that would be, she'd be the supplicant then. And yes, then exactly. She's out she of her could power just be seat. curious about it and hope someone answers it. So, These are subtle things when people identify with roles, and I see that a a lot with therapists. They have this kind of eyebrows up look on their face and the tones of compassion, and it's like, well, where is you in that? I know that's how you show up as a therapist, but I can't feel you there as a person outside the role. The EBE and Soul Mentor, where we have a Mm -hmm. funny little uh, mouthful of peanut butter a combination of ensoulment and mentoring. Uh, and soul mentor, that's a bit clever. Uh, it, uh, uh, we want to role model emotive maturity. Mm-hmm. And role modeling, paradoxically, role modeling emotive maturity means no role. It's Which about, is what a parent is supposed to do with a kid, not exactly, uncoincidentally. Not uncoincidentally. So the role, the lack of the role allows... Uh, 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 an insolvent or um, the freedom to self-reveal and and have a function of authority, but not on a role of authority, mm-hmm. so that the realness of their open heart is shown uh, in a way that is receivable by yeah. the facilitant or the insolventee, mm-hmm. and gradually allows the the. Um, protector to start to trust relationality in general really in well general said. and mm-hmm. so uh, the basic uh, um, uh, arbiter and uh, algorithm of of eb therapy is relationality it's about mm-hmm. helping people relate from their soul not from their role or their protective armor over fourth chakra so we We've got. We can get really technical with this. Uh, we could talk to a psychiatrist about it. But most of the time, the psychiatrist is already alienated after the first breath. That we we want to dissolve coping mechanisms. Uh, that's where they're lost right there. Mm-hmm. So, um, for any of you out there that this is going home to, if this feels warmer, less authoritarian, but maybe more functionally effective, if that if that teases your heart and your head that way, then you're getting what we're trying to say here about traditionally over rigid or under rigid, like in peer peer circles, uh, trying to therapize each other. Both extremes are non-relational, relative defining a relation between my soul and your soul, not between my protector and your protector. Yeah, and I think it's very much a moving target to find what the right yeah. combination mm-hmm. um, level of authority or whatever you want to call it is because it depends on the moment. So, you know, yeah. I, I think it would be impossible for either of us as uh, wordsmithy as we 
are to write some kind of manual about what the boundaries should be. It would just be be relational and see what yeah. the moment calls for exactly. and do a shit ton of work so that you can embody that and then see what happens. That There's exactly. the manual. Um, there's the manual right there. Like parenting, that one phrase. There's yeah. no parenting manual. Just feel what your kids are feeling while they're feeling it and why they're feeling it. There is, that's the whole manual right there. Same principle, it's so immediate, real soulful relationality with, with ourselves, others and divinity, it's all now, it's now. It's not inside of tubes of processing, it's inside of now processing, knowing processing. And, uh, and that, like you said, the gradation of authority, it's, it's a moving, it's a moving uh, rhythm. And and a, and a person who's got emotional maturity uh, uh, embodied just enough can know what that is in any moment to help the client to the facilitant. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to say here uh, is that we're trying to role model without a role of really of authentic soulful based relationality, and that's what we do in our personhood dharma. So role modeling without a role, I love that. It's a, yeah, a personhood exactly. go on. There it is. Uh, what time is it? Oh, we got a little. What time does we'll start? Yeah, we'll start for uh, number twelve here. Um, Wait, no, number 11. We're on eleven. Yeah, 11. yeah, eleven. Sorry. Well, here's a big one. It's it's a little. Bear with us. I'll try to phrase it tonally so where it, it can go in easy. Um, a state of emotive maturity that we just talked about reveals an inherent moral code that offers a universal ethic of human life, the lack of which has resulted in unembodiable and divisive revelation-based religious or modern relativism-based secular moral systems. Now that's a mouthful, mm -hmm. but what, what we mean, I'll translate that down. I, I, I need to be really precise in these assumptions so a hundred years from now when people read them they'll know exactly i didn't i didn't floral them up uh, with poeticism <laughs> uh, but what it really means is that uh we've never had a modally emotively mature people relating with spirit uh, because we've never none of us have ever had adequate parenting so any relationship to, that a person's consciousness when it when it interfaces with divinity and then here's the voice of God is, here's how you should act. Here's how you should be. That is how all of our moral systems have been constructed, the linchpin of which is sacrifice, unconditional love, and altruism. Uh, when uh, the, the light of supposedly divine God, the male God with a beard in the sky, uh, sent lightning bolts to write uh, uh, the Ten Commandments for Moses, uh, it was sorry with the burning bush folks that was that was weed that, that, <laughs> that, that, that was weed the burning bush now that doesn't mean you can't get a revelation on ayahuasca or on on uh, on weed or whatever it is other uh, burning plants yes other burning plants sure uh, <laughs> the earth serves that serves that up to us but yeah. to then that, that but then to disproportionately project that on a male anthropomorphized uh god that God told me this was the truth and emblazoned in stone. No morality is blazoned in stone. And so we could put a whole podcast just on the difference between revelation based moral systems, ethical systems, and revel and, and relative ones that more, more uh, in, uh, created by humanism. So we've got the religious revelation based moral systems and the humanistic real relative based ones. Well, you see a man running out of the store with the store manager chasing him saying he stole he stole the bread he stole the bread. Uh, yeah, let's say that that's true. Uh, the uh, the uh, dogmatic religionist would say, you know, he just sinned, thou shalt not steal wasn't that in the stone there wasn't it was it well, even if they find the ark, it's going to be all dust folks. Uh, same thing with the with the Ten Commandments. But anyway, now those humanists would say, why did he steal that bread? And if he's got a starving child at home, uh, humanism says, okay, maybe you got to pay a fine or spend 30 days in jail for stealing the bread. But you didn't commit a sin like religionists say, because say, your motive was to help your child. 
Now, there's no room for that technically in any religious moral system. There's no room for that. Everything's a sin if it goes against. And of course, you mentioned uh, two, two podcasts ago, the one commandment, for example, that we would change that just is so horribly abusive to children, and that is, thou shalt honor your father and mother, right. um, when it should be, thou shalt uh, honor your children. Uh, when you want to honor your, I, that's what I asked. I think I used that example. Did I, uh, where in school I asked, uh, well, how do you honor your, are, are we supposed to honor uh, 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 as a, as oh, a yeah. daughter who is abused by a father? You're supposed to honor the father who does that? And I got sent to the principal for being smart ass with God, you know. Who knew? <laughs> who knew that my teacher was God, you know? Uh, yeah, it's not really a relevant question because that kind of abuse is so rare. Right. It's not oh, like yeah. it happens. So all the never time. happens. No. Yeah, so it's, and it, it happened really, it's more... an edge case. Oh yeah. God. Yeah, as if these are one offs. You know, that <laughs> that fathers and daughters and mothers and sons doing mm -hmm. that with the doing being sexually intimate with each other was even more rampant in the old days, the old biblical times. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a modern invention because of the repression of sexual freedom, folks. Mm -hmm. This has been going on forever. Brothers and sisters, sisters and sisters, brothers and brothers. Uh, sorry, uh, we need a different moral code to adjudicate what's going on here. Identity says would offer. Uh, there's no sin. There's only what's emotively mature and what's emotively immature. And all of our morality is based on that pivot. And that's um, super relevant to if, if if the number of conversations I've had in the past, I try to abstain from debates uh, as much oh, as yeah. I possibly can. But when I do get hooked sometimes uh, with more sophisticated Christians, this will be the argument that they use, which is the, the door of that. Well, what is the basis of morality, if not revelatory, if not? Yes. Know, from this, from from the Bible or whatever, right. and right. this is our answer: is like um, someone who is em emotionally mature from the inside out can do good and doesn't need an external authority to um, dictate yes. what they should do. But how do you make that argument? Right? Yeah. It's very it, difficult. It's so off their radar screen. In that sense, to make it a little simpler, revelation-based moral ethics are top down, right. and humanistic are bottom up. Uh, for for identity, philosophically, here's where identity really gets philosophical. It enters the philosophical domain. Uh, for identity, the um, the humanistic version is too tepid and weak, and the revelatory one based, is too much based in belief and dogma. Both are equally uh, uh, ineffective in adjudicating what is actual, what is the morality for uh, 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 spirits having human experience. Mm -hmm. But not what God tells us or what the human tells us, which are the two, the top and the bottom. What is right in the middle? What is a what is an ensouled human being? They're living, walking versions of morality. They don't need a code. Like you just said, they've healed from the inside out. And, and we say at the bottom line, we talked about self-love uh, earlier. The, 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 the net result of a multiply mature person is self goodness goodness mm. not self-love self-goodness and that goodness is in our emotional body bones such that there's a natural morality and morality can be complex in any moment what should you do in this moment when this person is doing that to that person do you intervene do you let them go do you who do you do you take sides what do you all sorts of interesting complex questions come up but guided by an internal embodied sense of self-goodness the answer will automatically come through in the now moment. You don't have to go reference uh, Paul or Psalms uh, uh, <laughs> chapter one, verse 47. Turn uh, to, to page get a, 487. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, come on folks. I mean, okay. The religionists, the young souls, they need that kind of, um, of dogma, I guess, but you can have that dogma without a lot of these anti-human uh, uh, well, you know, dynamicals. It's a, a, a interesting story related to this. Um, just yesterday, I was talking to uh, a neighbor who's a kind of friend of mine and my neighbor ally about our mutual obnoxious neighbor who is the, <laughs> quote, bad actor. And uh, he's a very smart guy, um, the, the ally. And um, we have interesting conversations. Uh, he's well-educated, and um, we agree on a lot of things. But 
Well, and in talking about and strategizing healthy strategy of how to navigate with this uh, this bad actor neighbor, sometimes I'll give just unconsciously and just naturally say things like, "Wow, well, it seems to be getting worse." You know, it seems like he's um, actually asking for boundaries. He's twenty six, going on sixteen. And it seems like this rambunctious behavior, like when we try to assert boundaries, it just gets louder. Maybe, you know, this next level of sending a letter that is these kinds of signatures or from a lawyer, maybe those boundaries will help him feel the boundaries yeah. that he's unconsciously wanting. And I'll right. say something like that. And my ally neighbor has heard enough of these things from me that he's become annoyed by it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, 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 I, and I don't even say, I said half of the words that I just did, but I'm like, oh, yeah, it seems like he's crying for boundaries. Maybe this will help. And he's like, I don't care. It just has to stop. And I'm like, what? I'm agreeing with your course of action. <laughs> yes. What is the problem? And like, he can't tolerate. And so there was, there was literally a point where I was like, dude, what's the matter? Like, what, what just happened? I'm just- Why, why can't like, both be true? Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I literally was saying that. I totally agree with the course of action and this yeah. is my observation. And he's like, oh, yeah. I don't think it's relevant. I'm like, okay, but it's how I'm seeing the world and I think it's relevant. Like, why is it a problem for you? Yes. And he got a little bit of meta there and uh, he actually, I think it was not the first time that that happened. So they, yeah, he got a little bit of meta. And he said to me, which is not something people often say about me. He said, well, you're a nice person. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> He's like, I don't think I'm a nice person. And and I'm like, yeah, like there's so much about this guy that I don't like, but I also have compassion. And I saw a picture of his father and I can see what he did to him just in that. And I also know that this bad actor had heart surgery when he was six days old. Oh, my God. Oh yeah, God. I saw the scars on his chest. So, oh you know, having been hit by a car before the age of three myself, I know the kinds of things this does to a person. So wow. I can't not have compassion while I um, uh, he, he doesn't become an evil person for me. And yes. so like he can for my neighbor, who's a secular humanist scientist, he's like, this guy is mentally ill. He's bad. We just got to right. deal with the actions and all that. And so there was a paradigmatic clash where my own just innate uh, morality of like, I can't not care about this guy as much as he's triggering me. He's still yeah. a human being and he's medicating with all this music as well as other things. And yeah. yeah that's just how well, look what, you, look what your story just revealed here, Joseph. What Joseph just spoke to there was exactly the amelioration between top-down and bottom-up moral systems. Mm -hmm. Because what he's saying, there's always an and, yeah. not an either-or, in a true spiritually mature moral system. Both things can be true. Does this person have to be held responsible for his impact on his neighbors? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can we have compassion for why he doesn't? Yeah. Yes. What's the problem? Uh, but again, that would if, if there's an and there, we don't. Yeah, but what, when it, I bring the compassion, though, to my ally yeah, neighbor, it triggers right. him because yeah. he doesn't and he can't. Yes. And somewhere in him, he knows he should <laughs> he because should. that would actually uh, be real. Right. And that that's why he says, I'm you're a nice I'm not person. A nice person, person not, right? That, right? That was where it went to. Not like, oh, I wonder how my own emotional dystrophy causes me to cut my heart off from people and live in my mind, which would be a few steps down the road. But that's what yeah. he's doing. Yeah. Well, and most like secular, yeah, most secular humanists um, have that kind of um, bottom up uh, um, insobriety of heart. Yeah. They're clear as a bell. They're super intelligent. They they can articulate their positions, and and they they ra they ra really see that people should take responsibility for their actions. That's fine, but it doesn't mean loss of compassion. So what Joseph just described there is exactly the embodiment of the ethical system that comes out naturally of a mode of I maturity. wasn't even trying. <laughs> and, and that's, that's why it was and that's why it was uh, and so that's how we all become living walking moral systems mm -hmm. when we get this uh, state of embodied emotive maturity we don't need dogmas we don't need uh, uh, commandments and we don't need the harshness that often comes with the apparent uh, 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 heartfulness of well why he stole the bread counts that's right. And um, it does. Also related to this. Also related. To, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It does. No, that's fine. Also related to this. When, when um, 
uh, Stace and Bree and other EB people and identity people, when we get together and talk about some news story or some event third hand or whatever, it seems like 90 plus percent of the time we agree on the morality oh, or the yes. take of the situation without yeah. having talked about it at all yeah. beforehand, which is always really yeah. interesting. We, yeah. And when there are disagreements, usually in just a minute or two, the blind spot somebody has about it becomes revealed and then there is an agreement. Yeah. And without any kind of strategy or need for there to be an agreement, we just see moral things the same way. I, I've and uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I, I had in my head that's how to finish this today, and I forgot. Uh -huh. And then you just reminded me. So uh -huh. let me go one more step cool. with that, please. Uh, the the value system, the ethical moral system of identity, has this very strange proof of its likely sobriety in that people, the more people from completely different break backgrounds, different cultures, different religious orientations, different humanistic orientations, the more they mature their, their uh, soulful uh, uh, heart and deconstruct, subtract the protector's version of self, the more they share a common value system. Yeah. It's over 40 years that I can say what it looks like is that there's an innate moral system that that is associated with emotional maturity which goes a long way to substantiate and possibly verify uh, uh, our assumptions about emotion and the human heart and consciousness yeah because so, it's not revelatory and it can't be constructed in the mind but if no we're neither motive beings first then maybe it yeah. isn't maybe there's morality objectively in the soul in the soul and that's what we what we liberate uh, by our personhood dharma so if you're out there and oh i want to enlighten like the buddha or i want i want to i want to feel god i want a personal revelation of god in my personal experience those are great goals but there's nothing there's an equal equally important if not critical first step that we suggest you put as a goal to become emotively mature so when you do enlighten like the buddha or when you do have that personal experience of divine being you're not either escaping in the buddha way or not having a toxic you needing a god too much over your own self-authority so in that sense um it's a compelling it's not it's is uh, necessary but not sufficient. Isn't that the thing about logic? Uh, necessary, not not su uh, sufficient, but not. I f always forget the I think philosophy. Is, I don't can't I can't do it right it, now at the moment. But the point here <laughs> is, is that it's really interesting that those who do this dharma wind up having the same reactivities and moral, not judgments but moral perceptions. What's the other word? Discernments. Mm -hmm. discernments of morality and we all agree without like joseph said there's no rule how you should think about things or be with morality we don't take that up it just comes out naturally out of the emotively mature person yeah and it's, so that's and why either that or identity is a cult that is brainwashing people to all think exactly the same way and process reality the same you can be the judge of that yes <laughs> i will say you know i've become uh i've become more of a libertarian i used to be a democrat i mean the democratic party changed uh, uh more than in I our did. lifetimes yeah. yeah in our lifetimes yeah you tend to um politically seem to be a little bit more on the social side of things um, uh, but I find that the more my heart opens and the more compassion I find in me, uh, I mean, I mean, when I say I'm a liber libertarian, I mean, small L, not big L, big L libertarians yeah. are stockpiling mm -hmm. ammo and way too much in their heads. Um, exactly. but yeah. libertarianism in general is trying to rely on reason. And that's why that's where its limits are. If yeah. you add a bunch of compassion to it. So I think of myself as like an increasingly social libertarian. Um, <laughs> there and, you go. Uh, uh, uh -huh. but so we don't all agree like exactly on, on no things. we don't have and we don't have to yeah we don't have to uh, we're, we're all on our same uh, we're all on our, our own courses so uh, what where it downline forms and expresses as political labels uh, becomes really murky uh, for an emotionally mature person because they see the the bankruptcies on the right and they see the bankruptcies on the left almost equally and there's <laughs> no really heartfelt based political middle 
There's not. The, the progressives are the bleeding liberals who spend too much money, and the MAGA people are hard ass. Uh, well, you know, uh, I don't think uh, uh, Nikki Haley could be a, a president because, uh, in my terms, uh, women, they got, and here's a quote from today from a, a, an interview with a MAGA guy Nikki Haley. She don't, don't have no balls to scratch. She only scratches her head because she needs guidance from a man. Who said that? Somebody was interviewed about what he did he support. Nikki oh, just Haley. a man on the street. Just a man on the street. Oh and I'm, I'm using his accent and oh his God. verbosity here. He actually said she, she ain't got no balls to scratch. Wow. Like she can 18... only scratch her head. I want to say like 1840 called. They want their comments back. Wow, that's amazing. Well, and the, one day soon, maybe for our hundredth, will uh, our podcast will be on um, what kind of governmental structure would express a mode of maturity. We uh, made a little bit of a pass at that we, once. We have. We have. But, but I have to shout out though, because I'm very excited and also still perplexed. Mitch McConnell is stepping down at the end of. T- after having his perhaps 10th seizure, partial seizure on international TV, he's stepping down, but not immediately, just at the end of the year, right after the midterms. <laughs> no, not midterms. There's, it's not a midterm. Primaries. There's another so, Senate election, right? In, in, in November, yeah, in, right? Yeah, in November. Yeah. This so is he's not going to, so he's giving up primary. his seat in like six months. Yeah, because he's like you know what is he late eighties? I can't believe yeah. that this is allowed. I mean that guy is literally dying on camera. Yeah. Wow, but he could have gone yeah. another four years. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, and, and and then then he turns around with all the criticism of the, the orange man. He endorses him for president on his way out. Right. Yes. Because it doesn't matter that he's a lunatic. This is a lot of people, Republicans. It doesn't matter that the guy's a delusional lunatic narcissist, liar. It doesn't matter. We just got to keep the progressives out. We, we'll, we'll deal with, uh, with uh, the Donald, you know. Just got to keep out these, the, the deep state uh, that, can't, that are eating infants, sexually abusing them, and then eating them. That's a MAGA. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because that's, I mean, that makes perfect sense that people would do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why Biden's gone senile, according to the MAGA, these MAGAs anyway. That, he's not, not you know, getting enough he's baby eat, blood or he's yeah, eating too he, much he of it? Yeah, he needs more. He's eating. I think he's eating too much of it. That's what they would say. It's tough. Anyway, but once you have access to it, it's hard to moderate, I'm sure. Well, yeah, you get a taste just... for it, right? You just get a taste for it. Right? <laughs> oh, God. Sorry. We just had to role model that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so. Folks, uh, that's the, that's the uh, the podcast for today. I hope I hope you got something out of uh, everything. I got just I got said. one more thing before we go. The 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 brilliant film, brilliant Mike Judge piece of art called Idiocracy. You know that. Movie, oh yeah, right? yes. Very, very my well. my brilliant neighbor pointed out to me recently something. I've seen Idi- Idiocracy at least half a dozen times. He pointed out he made a case that in Idiocracy, there's ways in which their society is actually better than ours. And I was like, what? How? And he said, well, when they find out that the people from the past have the highest IQs in the world, they made one of them president and the other becomes CEO of Starbucks. We don't do that here. The smart people don't run the world here. I was like, wow, how did I miss that? That's exactly right. They made the smartest person president. Right. Not anymore. Not that that would be enough, but it would be something. It would be some that. objectively experienceable qualification, right? Yeah. Obama fit the bill, constitutional scholar. You might not have liked all, but I don't like, didn't like all of what he did, especially with the banking crisis. But yeah. the guy was a constitutional scholar and head and shoulders against uh, of IQs crammed in his head. So many IQs are spilling out his ears. Uh, didn't necessarily make him, in my opinion, make good choice, some good choices, but at least he was, he, he fit the bill there. You could tell he was thinking things through like yes. a fair right. amount. That's all I want in a leader. Someone who's actually who's thinking them through as le- at least as much as I am, you know, like right. that's lead that. I, to give the credit on the other side of the far right, one, one MAGA person in an interview, I like those when they spontaneously get interviewed with MAGAs. Usually the left wants to make fun of them, but here's one. It's, he said, so um, are you vote, what, what are you voting for? And he said, I don't know if I'm even going to vote. And the, and the guy said, well, why? He said, well, I, 
I want I want a president who's smarter than me. Oh, thank God. Yes. <laughs> and, and I don't think either of those guys are. And so I don't know what mm -hmm. to do. Now, that's there's a conservative I could hug, uh, do yeah. a bear hug with. Right. Sure. So we don't we're not right or left. We're and we're not even in the middle where there isn't a political uh, orientation that we could describe yet. But I think before I'm, de I'm dead, we'll have one, Joseph. We'll put together something. Uh, Fingers crossed. With words. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. So we'll continue with um, the last piece of the. No, no, there's two more, 12 and 13, right? Two here, more. There? Next one is about, wait for it, in, intimate relationship codependence. Oh, yeah. We'll so, have a lot to say about that. Oh, a lot. That may go too. We'll, we'll see how long yeah, that takes. It could. Okay. Okay, Joseph. Thanks so much Thank for today. Thank you, Stace. Thank you, listeners. Tune in next time for 91. And uh, thanks for hanging with us. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. To learn more about Stace Barron and Identity, please visit identity.org. To learn more about Joseph Shapiro, visit clearandopen.com. Until next time, we wish you well on your journey.